Take our Bibles and turn to the book of 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter number 6. This is Paul's letter to a young pastor, and he's encouraging that young pastor to um, stay away from the doctrines that we're hearing of today, doctrines of prosperity. Um, If you are prosperous, God has blessed you. And he says, but godliness with contentment is great gain. And then he warns us about the love of money being the root of all evil. And he's continually trying to instruct those who have wealth and how they should behave themselves. And he comes to verse number 17, and that's where I want to draw your attention. Verses 17 through 19. And really on just one phrase in verse 17. And you'll understand what I said, why I said what I said this morning. Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high minded nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. That they do good, that they that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate, that is to help the needy, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation, that's laying up treasures in heaven, against the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. But I want to draw your attention to verse 17, and this phrase, who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. And I want to, share with you a message, Overlooked Instructions. Overlooked Instructions. Let's pray. Father, please help us tonight. It is our desire, Lord, to follow you and your word. Lord, to instruct uh, uh, us, one another, and how that we should live in this world, how that we could bring glory and honor to your name. And I pray, God, tonight that you would help us in this area of our Christian walk. Uh, Lord, help us to see that uh, a joyful spirit, a a glad heart, uh, Lord, you have instructed us to let this light so shine before men that they might see that good work and glorify you, our Father, which is in heaven. Lord, help us to be aware that having a grumbling spirit, um, a bitter spirit, uh, uh, always a a sad countenance. Lord, it's not a good uh, testimony for the Lord Jesus Christ. And I pray, God, that you'd work in us tonight both the will and do your good pleasure. Bless the Word of God to our hearts, and Lord, help it to transform our lives and to make us more like Jesus For it's in Jesus' name we pray and ask these things. Amen. God is the living God. When I say that, sometimes I don't want to just, uh, I want to run on, but I think we need to pause often because in our day, people don't really understand those phrases anymore. That means that He is the only true God. There is no other God beside Him anywhere. He's not just the God of our earth. He's the God of all creation, over all universes. There is no God but Yahweh God, the God of the Holy Scriptures. And this one and true and living God, the Bible says, He, God, has richly given to us all things to enjoy. Now that's where I think sometimes that that we might think, now wait a minute preacher, don't start preaching heresy now. Because we almost have this mindset that Christians have to be like monks, you know, always walking around with robes on and long faces and murmuring prayers. And if you really want to be a pious, God-fearing man or God-fearing woman, You better keep all of that joy in check. You better be careful about every smile that crosses your face. I mean, you have to be the strict, disciplined person or else you're going to not really live consistently according to the pages of the Holy 
Scriptures. And it's amazing how we can take on these beliefs that are really not biblical beliefs. In fact, if you would take your Bible and go through it, you'd find that throughout the Bible, God's people are a rejoicing people. They are happy people. It's when they're murmuring and complaining that they displease God. Think about that. When they're having uh, times of doubt and they're bitter and murmuring, then God's wrath is stirred up. But when they're joyful and rejoicing, enjoying the blessings of God, then God is glorified in that. I think it's difficult for us to comprehend that because this word enjoy is only found two places in the New Testament. That is the Greek word, two places in the New Testament. Here in First Peter chapter number I mean First Timothy chapter six verse seventeen, and then in Hebrews eleven twenty five. How many of you know where Hebrew what Hebrews eleven twenty five is talking about? That's talking about Moses living down in Egypt. And as Moses lived in Egypt, he had a choice to make. He could either hide his Hebrew heritage, keep under wraps the fact that he was one of those people, an Israelite, and play the role of the Egyptian and enjoy all that Egypt offered. Now when we say all that Egypt offered, of course we're including in that all types of sinful, evil, ungodly things, right? And so the Bible says in Hebrews 11.25, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. So here you have Moses abstaining from enjoying something, and here Paul is instructing us to enjoy those things that God has generously given to all of us. We are to enjoy those things God has given to us. Now when's the last time you thought about that? About your joy level or how much you're enjoying the things God has given to you. I don't know why, but I love little children. I just love little kids. And I think because they are just so happy about everything. When our babies were especially little, at Christmas time, you put some thought in giving them a present. And you thought, well, they really, the girls, they would really love this doll. And so uh, you would find a doll you thought they might really enjoy and wrap it up and put it under the Christmas tree and they would open it up, throw the doll to the side and play with the wrapping paper or the box. Right? I mean, they're just having all kind of fun. Here's your gift. Laying over there. But boy, they're just enthralled with this box and wrapping paper. And wow, this is neat. And I think... That's very attractive, isn't it? How you can just be just astonished at little things, things that all of us have taken for granted, and we just look at it and say, what are you getting joy from? That's just a box. I'm going to throw it away and discard it. It has no value whatsoever, and yet they really take joy in it. Amen? And I think we should stop and reconsider the things that really bring us joy. What makes us happy? I think God might be happier and pleased and blessed if we were more like the little child that says, Lord, I don't just love love the doll. I love the wrapping paper. I love the box. I love everything. You're so good to me, Lord, to give me anything. I'm excited about all the good things that my Heavenly Father has given to me. Amen? And so I want you to think of, first of all, the confusion. The confusion. Somehow we've got in our mind that to be spiritually minded means that you have to be sober, solemn, and always real serious, right? Is that your thought when you come, hey, that's a spiritual man. I mean, he is sober, he is solemn, 
He is really, and it may be sometimes partly my fault because when I talk to you about the Lord, sometimes I want to show you that our Lord suffered. He was made into the likeness of men. He took upon himself flesh. God became a man, and I want to show you that his life on this earth wasn't an easy life. He was a man of sorrows. How many times you've heard me say this? Acquainted with grief, right? And so we get almost the thought that's all day, every day. That's all Jesus ever dealt with was grief and sorrow. I don't think that's the case. If you read in the New Testament, how many precious lives he helped and changed and transformed. I guarantee you Jesus got a lot of joy out of that. Amen? Perhaps one of the happiest men to ever, men to ever walk on the face of the earth was the God-man, the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, we, we get confused because we go to two extremes always. That's our tendency, right? Either we go way too far one way, isn't that the truth? Or we go way too far the other way, Right? And it seems like we don't know how to stay right there in that middle area that's really the best way to live our Christian life. In Acts chapter 17, Paul ran across two confused groups. He ran across in Acts 17, 18, the Epicureans, Epicureans and the Stoics. Remember, Phil, we looked at them not too long ago. You can probably get a sense of what the Stoics were like if you think of someone who is really Stoic and is just really strict and solemn. You know. And they taught, the Stoics uh, taught, that we were to be free from passions unmoved by joy or grief. You're not to be affected by this temporal world in any way whatsoever. You're to be above that. You're spiritual. This is material. Don't we kind of get into that sometimes when we think about Christianity, right? Isn't that true? I, I think sometimes we're looking for Christ and His kingdom, and, and please don't misunderstand me. We need to do that. That should be forefront in all of our thinking. But while we're traveling through this world of sorrows, we need to stop as often as we can and rejoice in all the great things that God has provided for us and He's doing for us. Amen? I like that song Vicky sings sometimes, and Brenda, my wife, helps her uh, when it talks about thanking the Lord and let me just kneel once more. Can I just kneel once more to say thank you, Lord, and how often are we taking that knee to say, wow, God, this is just wonderful. It's joyous. It's tremendous. And really take joy in the things that God has given to us. The Stoics said we need to be free from passion, unmoved by joy or grief. I think the modern church has taken on the Stoic mentality. <laughs> Right in the sense that we're unmoved by anything nowadays, right? No hallelujah, no raise the hand, no praise the Lord. Isn't that true? I mean, sometimes there's some things. I'm not a, a, the, the, the best of preachers, but even I run across some biblical truths once in a while that I want to just run out there and sit down and say, Amen! <laughs> you know, just because it's the Word of God. It's true. It's glorious. It's wonderful. Yes. What I'm saying is I think we're losing that. Yes. And we're sitting there, letting all these great, rich blessings pass us by without ever saying, Boy, I take great joy in that. I joy, I rejoice in what God has given to me. And if you stop and think about that a little bit, you'll be running around the church. <laughs> Especially when you think about having eternal life and going to heaven when you die. Amen? And it ain't going to be long. We're going to all be home. Whew, how are you going to behave yourself in glory land? Sit there in heaven, arms folded, 
eyes kind of drawn together, looking around, thinking, what are all these people so happy about? It's just heaven. Let us be a little bit more spiritual than that. We're in heaven. Behave yourselves. Do you think they're going to do that? No. 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 They're going to be like when your favorite football team scores. <laughs> or whatever it is else that brings joy out of your heart. That, that makes you want to say, well, amen, good, praise the Lord, that's wonderful. I want to embarrass my sons, but sometimes they'll, I'll pass by their room and they're just extremely energized by what's going on. They'll, think, they'll say like, oh no! I can't believe that! Carrie recorded her brother the other day and shared that recording with me. <laughs> he was playing some game with some other guys on on uh, some game they had together and they were all in it. Ah, ah, ah. <laughs> Not They didn't sound like that. They were more manly than that. Don't want Corey to get me. And then the Epicureans, they taught that there was no afterlife. So eat, drink, and be merry. Here's one who say, you've got to be above everything. Keep your calm now. Be cool. Don't, don't, don't. And then you have the other one saying, hey, if you're going to shout, you might as well shout now. <laughs> If you're going, if you're going to do something exciting, jump off the bridge now. You know, do something great now, because there's nothing out there. Neither one of those are true. Amen. Amen. But there is a middle ground. There is reason to rejoice today. Out of all the good things, if you just stop and think about the good things your heavenly Father has provided for you just this day. There's reason to have a big old smile on your face. Isn't that right? <coughs> and so sometimes we're confused about that. We want to act like those who are either strict and disciplined with no... By the way, I don't think Christ is really pleased with that. I really don't. And how would you like to give someone a gift and they look at it and they say, Oh, well, thank you. Like, well, I don't know if you like this or not. I mean, you, you did you enjoy that? Did you enjoy that? Or, I mean, do you really want it? Are you really wanting to give it back? Have you ever had that kind of experience where you're like, I don't know if I just gave you something you hated or you loved. I don't know what to do. And I think sometimes God gets that same reaction from us. After He's given us great things, we act as though it's not really that big deal at all. And I think he's pleased when we take joy in the things that he has given to us. In the context, Paul is saying to the rich men that have riches in this world, don't be proud, prideful about your wealth. Don't look down on others. Verse 17, charge them. That is, challenge them that are rich in this world that they... Be not high-minded. Don't look down your nose at others. Don't think better of yourselves than those who might not have as much as you. And then he says, nor trust in uncertain riches. You may be rich today, but poor tomorrow. So don't, don't joy in your wealth. Don't rejoice in possessions. But trust in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. You see, we're all triune beings. Triune. That is, we have a body, right? But that's not the end of us, right? Because when they lay a loved one down the casket, we look in that casket and we know something is no longer there. We may not know what to call it, but we know something's gone. Whatever animated them, whatever caused them to laugh and cry and speak and love, that, that part of them 
has exited from the body. It's no longer there. The book of James says the spirit has left the body. That's the separation between that body and soul. That person's dead now. But we're not just a body. We have a soul. And the only reason I want to point out, this soul needs to be maintained, cherished, and cared for. Because if you, you, we get so much concerned about our body, but what about our, our inward man? What about the joyful heart? What about, what about how we feel? You know, people are all around us today. They may smile on the outside, but the truth is on the inside, they're hurting. They don't know where their joy is. They are not enjoying anything. Life to them is not joyful. Is that true? We have a lot of people with great mental problems and also spiritual problems. You young kids that are here, you're not just a body. You have a soul and a spirit. And if, that, if you haven't come to know Christ as your Savior, that spirit that's in you can't have fellowship with the God that made you. And the only one that can bring fellowship between you and God is Christ. And He brings about life. And that new birth brings us into fellowship with God. Amen? You've got to be concerned about your spirit, not just your body. You see, why would you say that, preacher? Because our emotional well-being is important. Our spiritual well-being is important, just as important as our physical well-being. If we neglect our soul and spirit, that also affects our life, doesn't it? Amen. Is that true? Yeah. And we may be physically fit, but if we have stress in our heart, does that affect our physical body if we have stress? Yeah. I mean, that, that part of us is important. And by the way, yoga is not going to help with that. The preacher, what are you saying? Listen to these verses, all right? Proverbs 15, verse 13. A merry heart maketh a cheerful countenance, but by sorrow of heart the spirit is broken. A merry heart maketh a cheerful countenance. I'm smiling. I'm happy. And I see people that barely ever smile. I worry about them. I get concerned about them. I look at them and I don't ever see a smile coming across their face and, and you maybe tell a little joke and they just barely crack a little smile. I wonder what is really going on in your inner person that you can't even feel comfortable enough or happy enough to smile. It's on our faith. Proverbs 15, 15, listen to this verse. All the days of the afflicted are evil, but he that is of a merry heart hath a continual feast. Isn't that good? <laughs> listen to Proverbs 17, 22. You've heard this one before. It's really a good one too. A merry heart doeth good like a medicine. Right, when you're sick and you need some help and the doctor says, now if you take this, it will cure your sickness. I guarantee you. Have you ever had some infection and you receive some antibiotics and you're instructed on how to take them and you follow the doctor's instructions and before you take the last pill, that infection is gone? The antibiotics have done their job. Well, think about this. A merry heart doeth good like a medicine. You know they have tried that in medical journals. They brought people in that caused the people that are suffering and have pain, going through difficulties, they would laugh and joke. And those that laugh and joke would recover quicker than those that never had family members that would come by and encourage and cause them to laugh and give them joy. So the Bible is true, amen? God told us that. Mary Hart does good like a medicine. 
That's why it's important. What I'm telling you is that's important because often you have, a t- you have times that you can listen. And I, I, mean, I hope you understand this statement. This is not a heretical statement either. Sometimes you have to have joy and enjoy something just by faith. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes you have to pray just because God said pray. Sometimes you have to look at something and say, you know what, I should be overjoyed because of this. And I am not. I am now. I'm going to smile and be happy and praise God, praise the Lord because of this that He has richly given to me. And by the way, that list, it's like the list of things that we should be thankful for. It's numerous. I mean, sometimes a brother Bruce gets up and he says something like, I just want to thank God for my ears. I'm like, Bruce, <laughs> I got to thinking the other day, if I didn't have ears, what would I look like? Probably couldn't hear that well. and uh, So I just started praising God for my ears. One time he says, I was out there working and I was sweating away and that sweat was coming down, rolling off my eyelashes. I thought, you know what? That's amazing. Eyelashes. Thank God for eyelashes. Now, have you ever thanked God for eyelashes? I never even get that any thought, you know? But it's something to give God praise over it and you think about it. You understand what I'm saying? A merry heart doeth good like a medicine. But listen, but a broken spirit drieth up the bones. Now, Sister Linda, I don't know exactly what that means, but I don't want dried up bones, do you? So we need to learn to enjoy all things that God has richly, generously given to us. Listen to Ecclesiastes 9 7. Go thy way. Eat thy bread with joy. And drink thy wine with a merry heart. Again, I, I want to insist, I believe that's not alcoholic beverage. I believe that is just fruit of the vine, grape juice. They probably didn't call it grape juice back in those days. For God now accepteth thy work. Go thy way, eat thy bread with joy, drink thy wine with a merry heart. For God has just now accept thy works. John fifteen eleven. These things have I spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. Isn't that true? Amen. So when Christ looks at his children, he wants us to have this abounding fullness of joy. And we're not going to have that fullness of joy until we realize God has richly given me all things to enjoy. I mean, I ought to use them with joy and rejoice in the fact that I have them so that I can use them. I mean, when's the last time you're driving down the road just thinking, this beats bicycle riding any day of the week? Amen? Or horseback riding. I used to think that would be fun, right? But probably after the tenth mile, it would start, probably start to wear on you, right? <laughs> and just having these things that we can use. See, I don't have a car because I'm smart or wealthy, and I have a car because God has richly given that to me. I have a home to live in because God has richly, generously given that to me. I've got a bed to sleep in because God has provided that for me. There's a roof over my head because God has met that need. I've got shoes on my feet because God has given that to me. And He's done the same thing to you, amen? And, and, and when we use those things He's given us, we are to enjoy that and we are to thank God for it, Amen? Think about the conflict. The conflict comes when you think about Hebrews 11.25 and 1 Timothy 6.17, right? Here's the conflict. Don't enjoy the pleasure of sin for a season. 
Richly enjoy all things God has given to you. Now those passages do not contradict one another. One is talking about the pleasure people get that selfish, sensual. They're going to use things just to use them for themselves. No matter if they hurt anybody and it don't matter if they break God's heart, they're just going to do what they want to for themselves. And I've got a New Testament example for you that's so familiar with you that it will help you, I believe, the prodigal son. Now really, there was two parties that were written about that we know of, right? He went and wasted his substance on riotous living. We don't have any times he went out and used that wealth for all types of sin and debauchery. But when he came home, there was another party thrown because there was joy that the son that was lost had now been found. Amen? Here's one, the son going out here just doing what he wants, satisfying his sensual desires, sinning, thinking he's going to find joy in that lifestyle, and it brings him nothing but loss heartache and want. Isn't that true? Until he finally comes to himself and realizes, man, what am I doing wasting my life out here doing this stuff? I don't have two pennies I can rub together now. I've, got, I've wasted my entire inheritance. What am I going to live on in the future? I'm in the hog pen wanting to eat the slop that the hogs are eating. How did I get here? You got there because of sinful, sensual pleasures. You see, Moses said there is pleasure in sin, but he said it's for a season. You see, that flesh says, wow, that feels good. But that feel-good fleshly thing doesn't last very long. Amen? And then after you commit that sin, you have to deal with grief. And that feeling of, I know I shouldn't have done that. What am I doing? How can I sin this way? Oh, the, the agony of heart, the grief of soul because of sin. But when you do something that God has given you and you enjoy that, that doesn't come with grief and heartache. Amen? When the father killed the fatted calf and clothed the son again, put the ring on his finger, all of that was right and good and great, great rejoicing was found in that. Amen? So there are some things you can enjoy, but be careful that you're not enjoying sinful things. That pleasure only lasts for a short season. But if you're enjoying the things of God... That lasts forever. Amen? Those things are good things, wholesome things. And by the way, you could do the very same thing, the act, and that act either please God or displease God. Isn't that true? Think about marital relations. Inside the marriage... Boy, that's a blessing. That's wonderful. It's good. Outside of that, it's fornication, it's sin, and it's wrong. Isn't that right? Same act. But one is enjoyment according to God's will. The other is enjoyment according to the fleshly desires. One is sin and the other is righteousness in God's sight. Amen? Eating. You can overeat or you can enjoy fellowship with others that is just good, enjoyable, eating, fellowship, enjoying the meal, enjoying the company, right? When I think of that, I, think, I can't help but think Christ standing at the door of our heart, knocking on the door and says, now if you will let me come in, invite me in, I will sit down and sup with you and you can sup with me. You and I could share a meal together. And the sharing of that time together, that supping together, we can have fellowship one with another. 
And boy, that's enjoy that's enjoyment. Amen? That's great. But one of the sins that he listed in Sodom was fullness of bread. Right? Same thing, same act, eating. But one is eating for fleshly desires and cravings and wants, and the other is eating what's laid before us, what is in moderation, what brings glory to God. Amen? He said, Preacher, I just don't, I don't know. I, I get let me, think, let me try to get it across to you this way. Think about all that God has done. And I think if you think about creation, you'd have to stop and say, you know what, God must have wanted us to enjoy His creation. Doesn't that make sense? Because if, if, if He didn't have any desire for us to see how wonderful and amazing He is, He would have made everything just in black and white. We've lived in just a black and white world. Everything would just be color, no color, just plain like the old TVs. How many old enough to remember black and white TVs? Right? Everybody looked like they had the same color shirt on. Right? You distinguish the good, good cowboys from the bad cowboys, right? Because one had a little darker clothing, the other had like, oh, that guy must be good, that must be bad. And then they put color with them, and you thought, how many of y'all ever saw a show, and then later on they put color with it, and you thought, that is amazing. <laughs> you ever done that? I didn't realize it was like that. That's something. And God, look at all these stuff. Have you ever been to Lowe's or Home Depot and looked for paint? Yes. We were going to paint something the other day. And Bruce said, it's, it's white paint. I said, Bruce, there are thousands of colors of white. Yes. They're not just white paint. There's thousands of shades of white. I don't know how many shades there are. One color. You think, well, blue. Well, what color of blue? <laughs> Light blue, dark blue. Nate, I mean, I mean, it just goes on and on and on, right? And why did God do that? So we can look at it and say, wow, that's beautiful, that's lovely, that's great. He could have made flowers and they not smell at all. No, no odor to them, no pleasant odor whatsoever. Right? Did he do that though? You go up to a beautiful rose and smell the, the, that sweet fragrance from a rose and enjoy that fragrance off that rose. And what should happen is, you should say, God, you're just a great God. You're amazing. How can you do this? I, I can't comprehend it. Bruce had gotten me to eat a few uh, different uh, types of nuts, peanuts and pecans and cashews and uh, Brazilian nuts and macadamias and and peanuts, did I say any of them twice yet? And uh, pecans, did I say pecans yet? I did. And cashews. And just on and on and on, you could go, right? And, and so I've been eating them before, and I thought, you know what, I'm going to see if cashew tastes much different than a peanut. And it's amazing how much different they taste. Right? And you think, how does he do that? How can he get such variation? I mean, they're almost the same thing. And the case to totally different. Why is it that way? I think he wants us to enjoy, richly enjoy, all those things that he's given to us. Have you stopped and thought about that later? When's the last time you've just done something like that? You know, we get such poor habits, don't we? We always pray over every meal, and I, I do that because I want God to know, I appreciate you giving us something to eat. We don't live in a, a famine area, but we could. And just because we live in America don't mean that you're going to have a meal on the table. There's a lot of families that don't. 
And so I want him to know, Lord, I just appreciate that. Thank you. you. You're the one that put this on the table. I didn't put it on the table. You did. But, have, I mean, how, when's the last time? You know, we get such a habit of saying, Lord, well, thank you for the food. Blessed be my body. Amen. If you really stopped and thought about, you know, this is an amazing thing here. Look at what, how God made this and made this for us. Right? I, I don't want to get silly with y'all, but I'm glad we don't live under the law. Because bacon is really good. <laughs> Amen? That ain't nothing like bacon. Kind of like that commercial on TV. Bacon, 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 bacon. <laughs> I'm not trying to be silly, but I mean, just think about all those types of things. The different landscapes and and the beach and the mountains and the waterfalls and the and the trees, the multitude of trees, diversity of trees. It's not just one tree. It's a it's all types of uniqueness that God has made everywhere. And I don't think that we are enjoying those things like God wants us to. Take a deep breath of fresh air. And realize God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. Amen? So what I'm trying to encourage you to do is to stop a little bit more often and just enjoy I think it wouldn't be. It's not a slothful thing, not a slothful thing, not a lazy thing when you pillow your head at night to say, God, this is so good. Have you ever went work just hard, just worked and worked and worked and laid down? You know what the Scripture says? He giveth His beloved sleep. Just to rest. Amen? I've been where I couldn't sleep at all. For almost a month, I couldn't sleep at all. And honestly, I craved just a little bit of con- consistent sleep. And what a blessing it is just to be able to pillow your head at night and rest for a little while. Amen? Think about that and make sure that you stop and praise the Lord for His goodness to us. Amen? Listen to... Ecclesiastes 5, these are the final verses. Ecclesiastes 5, 18 through 20. Behold that which I have seen, says the wise preacher Solomon. It is good and comely for one to eat and to drink. This is that Ecclesiastes where he says, it's vain, it's vain, it's vain, it's worthless, it's empty, there's nothing to it. It doesn't mean anything. Life is nothing. There's nothing there. It's worthless. It's worthless over and over again. And said, Behold, that which I have seen, it is good and comely for one to eat and to drink and to enjoy the good of all his labor. It's all right to look around and say, God, thank you. Thank you. That he taketh under that the labor that he taketh under the sun all the days of his life, which God giveth him, for it is his portion. I, I think verses like that probably we should meditate on a little bit more. Amen. Every man also to whom God hath given riches and wealth, and hath given him power to eat thereof and to take his portion and to rejoice in his labor. Listen, this is the gift of God. I used to work with Tiffany Marble and sometimes we did some intricate work. Uh, showers and bathtubs and building up uh, just layers of decks around tubs and showers and sometimes when I finished that I would step back and think, that looks good. That's good. I mean, everything fit good. That looks good. And I took pleasure in it. But I never stopped and thought, God, thank you for giving me the skill and the physical ability and the strength to do this. 
For it is his portion. Listen to verse 20. For he shall not much remember the days of his life. Now listen to this verse. It's an amazing verse. This is Ecclesiastes 5.20. I would challenge you to meditate on this verse. Son. For he shall not much remember the days of his life because God answereth him in the joy of his heart. You say, preacher, what is he saying? He doesn't stop and think about all the past blessings. Why? Because he's enjoying right now what God is doing. Right now. He don't have time to do like we do sometimes. Back in 1924, you know, I used to really be a tough guy. I could climb a mountain with one hand tied behind my back. and You know? And it seems like we all just live in the past. But God said, listen, I'm doing some amazing things right now for you. You stop and think about what I've done recently. And you could say, wow, you can be so excited about what God's doing now that you forget about all that in the past. Is that, I mean, that's good, that's good for me to think about that. Amen? That God is doing just a great, as a great a work now as He's ever done before, and sometimes we're missing it. Because we've forgotten to enjoy all this that God is doing in our lives. Amen? So we can do a couple of things tonight. We can recommit to stop and be a little bit more thankful for God's blessings. Amen? Recommit to say, Lord, on purpose, just by faith, I'm going to say thank you. And then if we're here tonight and we're unsaved, we can come to faith in Christ so that we can start living a really joyful, joy-filled life. You're not going to know what joy is until you meet the Lord. Amen? And so the first thing is to come to Christ and receive Him as your personal Savior. Christian, please stop and remember the Bible says that we should... Rejoice in those things that God has given to us. Let me read that one more time. But in the living God, trust in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. He don't give us sin to enjoy, but He gives us plenty of things that we can really take joy in. Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank You for...